customers, primarily our business customers, um, uh, realize their software development uh, needs uh, by working with partners um, within the Gebea network. So thank you for making time to come through this afternoon. I know it's precious time. You could have been having lunch with other people. And it being a Friday, it's uh, even more precious. And I hope it's going to be a very meaningful um, engagement. Uh, share a lot of the ideas and the learnings we've had as we undertook certain GMIT projects. And we hope those may be of value to you, either in terms of learnings you could take to your projects into the future, or if you want to work with us going forward, then it's something that we would, be, we would welcome. So uh, I won't take for granted. We know what Gebea is. Um, Gebea is Africa's largest talent marketplace, um, and uh, we're trying to leverage a network of partners, um, be they individuals or uh, organizations, to be able to create um, meaningful um, services for our customers. Um, most of the times, because um, our focus has been on, on the technology skill set, most of the, the times, um, the, the products and services that we get to work on are software-based or, or IT-related. Now, um, we have worked with a strong partner network. So a partner is an organization that shows, that demonstrates specific capability that uh, we can then utilize in, in, in providing services to our customers. Um, so we have a strong partner network, we, which we've been building over time and that has proven itself to be quite reliable to our customers. And um, coupled with the approach that we've taken, which we're gonna talk about called the GMIT approach, it's been able to produce quite some interesting results. Um, this approach is a bit unique in that um, the term I'm actually using these days is engineering as a service, and I'll come to that a bit later because um, a lot of the people we are encountering um, coming to Gebea, um, especially from a business background, uh, prefer to have uh, Gebea work in, in conjunction with them to create a particular product. And I, I would say a product life cycle, uh, because that's actually what they want to say. They're not creating just something for the sake of, of creating it. They want to have some longevity around it. And they feel that um, the approach that we take is the most sustainable uh, for them, um, as opposed to them going to look for even talents within our talent pool, individuals, and then trying to put them together into a coherent team to deliver the, the final product. They found it easier to basically collaborate with Gebea to build um, the minimum viable product, the MVP, and then work on iterations that build on that, what we call mi minimum business increments. And so far, that's actually pro proven quite um, um, useful. Uh, we have several customers who uh, we are currently on the, um, the, 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 the post-MVP iterations of, of the solution. Um, and, and as a result of this, it's helped a lot of these customers with budgets that may not be mind-blowing. We're talking about between $5,000 and $10,000 for an initial MVP and iterations as low as $2,000 um, that, that have helped them actually work at the pace of their project, uh, the, the, the project financing, and also helps them also prioritize which are the most important capabilities that like to see the product. And as a result, the product roadmap emerges really well. That is a very good nexus between what they're capable of achieving with the resources they have at hand and what um, the market demands in terms of its the, the, the most important features. Um, and as I've mentioned, this, this service is, is proving to be popular because um, it takes away the headache of having a full engineering team and then trying to manage uh, the team um, for in terms of efficiency and productivity. Um, it, the, the, the converse is you basically agree on targets and goals and, and basically get um, the service to, to deliver on those, those obligations. And as a result, we've embarked on some very interesting roadmaps 
uh, that uh, also are flexible in that they could change as we move along uh, because the, the client may identify something they feel is a higher priority that they not envisioned in, in the initial um, planning of the of the product and we're able to quickly adapt and, and help them be agile. So as I mentioned before, uh, how we're achieving this is a strong partner network as well as uh, the use of a GMED approach. Um, so the GMED approach has actually been refined based on um, very good learnings because uh, we've gone through a few uh, interesting scenarios where we've, we've gathered the experience, lessons that we've learned from prior projects where we made certain um, uh, decisions that could have been made in a better way. And uh, they've resulted in um, what we distilled into a three-step process to help with, um, with actually help with, with coming up with a, with a good product, a product roadmap that is feasible, that basically is efficient and is able to enable you to, to achieve your outcome as quickly as possible. So we've leveraged that pro project experience. And as we undertake more and more projects, we are continuously learning from them. And this is actually being fed into the GMED approach. So it's not a static uh, approach, it's actually uh, dynamic in that it's improving. And as we, the scenarios change and we learn new things, we're able to refine it and improve on it. But it's typically three steps, um, where the first step um, is front-loading a lot of the conversations around what you want to do as a customer. Um, and this typically happens despite you having documentation and all, most of the time, sometimes we get customers with, with the user, user designs on Figma, um, but we still go ahead and have this conversation. Um, <clears throat> and the reason we do this is because um, if we don't get a good understanding of what we're trying to achieve, the project has a very high likelihood of not being um, um, successful. And as a result of our experience, it normally is very painful in the latter stages of, of, of delivery. So we ensure that we, we, we have a conversation around the product vision. Then um, once we, we have a good grasp of what we want to do in terms of product vision, at least for the minimum viable product, uh, we then are able to tap into our, our network of partners. And uh, we put this information out to them and seek to get the best approach uh, in terms of uh, delivery, uh, cost, uh, um, methodology, that would, would achieve this particular product vision, um, albeit for just for the MVP uh, in the most efficient way. And this is typically by way of a proposal um, that the client then is able to review. And if more refinement is required, then we undergo a process where we, we discuss that further. And then finally, we settle on, on the partner we work with um, um, and then basically focus on delivery of that particular um, uh, function of the, of the product, be it the MVP, or if it's an increment, then the business increment that, that is being uh, undertaken as part of the product roadmap. So I'll dive a, a bit deeper into each and every step um, and then we can we can have situations where you can ask questions. I'm sure some of you may have some burning questions as to um, especially what pitfalls to avoid in, in certain scenarios. Um, so the first step typically is we clarify the product vision. Um, and uh, this, this is really where the, the crux of the matter is. Um, what happens is we engage with the client in in sometimes really lengthy discussions. And when I say lengthy, I have situations where we've talked for about a year with some clients uh, before they've actually gotten to the place where they are comfortable with what, of this mutual agreement on what may be the way forward. Um, the whole idea is just to get a very good idea of what the product vision is, because if we lack uh, an understanding of the product vision, we'll commit resources to, um, um, uh, catastrophic scenarios. If we do the project really well, we'll build something nobody wants, um, which is really a, 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 an errant waste of resources, which we wouldn't want to get into. Or even worse, we'll build something that um, is of value, but is not being done really well. 
And as a result, will leave a very bad uh, impression in the market and affect even future versions of the product or even other people trying to put the product out there. So we seek to understand what we're trying to do with the client, uh, what the product vision is. Um, all these uh, uh, artifacts that the client may have, uh, documentation, um, um, designs in Figma or Adobe that help us visualize, understand, help us move much faster. Um, and the approach we take is human-centered because we would like to and, and understand uh, first of all, who the customer is or who the beneficiary of, is of the product that is being uh, created and uh, how they would benefit from this. And as a result, then we seek to understand then the best way to deliver this particular benefits to the customer or the beneficiary. And so our approach is typically human-centered um, and with the aim of trying to solve real problems. Um, not necessarily because you can get caught up in that trap where you're creating technology for the sake of just creating technology. This brings to mind a particular scenario that we're actually undertaking right now where we have um, someone from the medical um, uh, field who would like to undertake um, a blockchain project with, with us. And we, at this stage, where we're trying to seek to understand why we would want to utilize blockchain as um, the technology in place to address the specific uh, medical use case. So the initial thinking was it, it would be just for basic uh, medical related uh, processes, isn't it? Um, but on further uh, discussion and refinement, we realized that um, there is need to think a bit more and a bit further and also a bit wider as to what the applications of the blockchain will be. So we've, we've gone back to the drawing board severally with this particular client to make sure that if we invest in um, our time and efforts into creating a blockchain-based product of software or whatever it is that is for that particular medical use case, it's of value to everybody and the stakeholders within that particular ecosystem. So we're not just going to do a blockchain project because, well, blockchain is the valve now and everybody is, is trying to get into it. No, we, we seek to understand what we're trying to do. Then we also try to um, make sure that there's a very good product market fit. I think I've hinted at that um, before we embark on the next stage, which is the next uh, aspect of the GMED approach. Um, it's ideal if the client has already identified the good product market uh, fit, what specific market you'd like to at least initially start with. Um, there are certain red flags we pull out. If you have a mass market product, um, chances are it's, 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 it's a bit too broad. Um, you need to refine the market because especially because of the, the different dynamics of adoption of products and services. You typically would target early adopters in any, in any ecosystem. So how do those people look like? What do they feel? What, what, what are the expectations? Because these are the ones who would influence the larger market. Um, so so, so those, those, those are the kind of things that we think about, we discuss at this stage where we're clarifying the product vision. Um, an ideal outcome of this particular scenario is we come up with low, low fidelity designs. Um, and the idea here is just to break down what we, we, we have in mind in terms of some designs that have not invested a lot of effort and time into creation and can quickly be pivoted or, or changed depending on the discoveries that we have along the way uh, of this stage. Um, and they, they also have a very good advantage in that they are a good um, waypoint that we can pick up conversations from um, as we move along towards coming up with, 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 a, with a final product vision. And these low fidelity designs are also a very good uh, artifact that you can then present uh, to your designers if you want to they utilize a separate design team to then come up with high fidelity designs that we can then use to, to, to build a product with. So 
So post, post that stage, we then move to a situation where we come up with our um, functionality and we seek to prioritize it. Now the prioritization is basically uh, on account of the constraints of resources and the most important resource being time. Um, so it's just a question of what would we, if we had a, a very limited amount of time at our disposal, what would we do first? Um, and then secondary to that is, okay, if we need to keep the attention of our target group, our target customers or stakeholders, um, what do we need to catch their attention uh, the soonest and, and start and, and maintain it? Um, and then, of course, there's elements like, okay, so what can we uh, achieve with the, the best utilization of our resources, be they financial or even a skill set? Um, that we have at our disposal to be able to then um, achieve an initial first step. Now, when we, we also prioritize the functionality, we are literally behind the scenes um, trying to break down the broader product vision into smaller steps that we can take. Be it even within the minimum viable product, which is the initial uh, version of the product that we want to create, we are able to then uh, come up with something that um, would demonstrate the achievement of that minimum viable product that would help us in identifying the emergence of that minimum viable product. So this would typically be in terms of capability or functionality. Um, and uh, these are functionalities and capabilities that can be tested and accepted. Uh, by our clients, and then uh, this would basically uh, help us to move towards achievement of, of what we were, we're hoping to, to achieve with, with, with the product. Um, the most important ones are the ones done fast, um, and the, the ones that are of least importance are, are relegated to future iterations or minimum business increments that we can then attack later or revisit it just to see if they're still of a high priority uh, at a future date. Um, and this helps to also draw the line for everyone to understand where the boundaries are um, and, and what the scope of the project would be so that uh, it's clear in everyone's mind that this is what we would like to achieve. Also, uh, once we draw the line, we can then understand what assumptions we need to make to achieve that particular functionality, what resources we need to put together so that we can then make sure that these are in place so that we can um, um, basically deliver the product vision. At this stage, you typically have um, a functional proposal um, or a proposal that's in its final stages that the client, uh, the, the partner, and Gebea basically have consensus on in terms of what uh, is going to be the, the scope of the project, be it a minimum viable product or a business increment along the product uh, roadmap. Then uh, the third stage is identifying the most uh, adequate partner to work with to deliver this uh, particular uh, product. Um, and what we do is we typically borrow um, or reach into a partner network. Um, as I mentioned in the previous stage, you have a proposal. This is normally uh, or requirements that we normally circulate amongst our partner network and uh, following several uh, conversations with different partners, we're able to then identify the partner who would best be placed to deliver this particular uh, project both in terms of capability and also um, budget and also sometimes even just um, co-location uh, because sometimes you may need to have a partner who's in the same um, uh, locale as yourself. So in case you need to have meetings where you, you basically have face-to-face -face meetings that the partner is available to do that. Now, Gebea being Pan-African, uh, we've tried as much as possible to make sure our partner footprint cuts across the, the whole of Africa so that um, our client requests are met, especially with regards to co-location. It's possible to get a partner who is in the same vicinity as you. Uh, so as a result of this selection, uh, we get a final uh, proposal or, or, or definition of what we want to do. Um, and, and it's it's 
and this partner basically assists in designing the solution in such a way that um, it, it's scalable. Uh, so it's not built um, just to uh, achieve the initial uh, thinking, the minimum viable product. It's actually capable of, of growing into a much larger project um, and, and scaling. Um, so we've done this by curating who we onboard as partners. They have this understanding. And also during the conversations we have about uh, the product roadmap, especially the partner and the client, uh, this basically emerges uh, quite a bit with regards to um, how this product can scale into, into the future so that it's not encumbered by an initial design flaw. Um, then the best, uh, the partner with the best proposal is the one we engage for the product build. Um, and this is basically the one we, we run with on the project. And the project typically gets executed uh, within the parameters I would set aside. There are several variations. Um, mine, if you ask me with regards to how long it takes to deliver a product, um, but most of our experience has been that um, we actually identify the next increment of the, of the product as the project is ongoing. And as I said earlier, uh, quite a few of our clients actually come back to us with um, discussions about uh, a next increment, a, the, a, a subsequent business increment that can be done maybe at a smaller budget that would enable them to maybe add two or so, a few functionality to the, the original minimum viable product. So um, during the marketing effort for this webinar, we talked about um, a particular minimum viable product we worked on that was um, really took the rails off the uh, off of of the um, of the train, if I can use that term, with regards to how quickly we're able to put things out. Um, the use case here was a product called Mchudo. I think the the first webinar we actually went into a deep dive of this. Um, this was a return customer who had um, done a prior product with us. Um, uh, a credit lending product. And um, he, after a couple of years, came back and um, very recently felt that he wanted to put together a solution um, with us. And we went through the three steps that we're talking about. And we settled on a partner in Ghana called Asid. Um, the client is actually domiciled in Kenya. Uh, and uh, we're able to then work uh, with that particular arrangement. And uh, within a three month period, we were able to build a product that uh, has been able to, to, to put some good numbers onto the board. Um, uh, this particular product is now past MVP stage. It's actually on its next business increment. And uh, we foresee a situation where we'll do multiple subsequent increments. Um, as very minor, if, if, if I may say so, but that would allow us to, 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 to grow this product um, maybe, on, on a, maybe at, at a quarterly basis, if I would be that bold. Um, and in about a year or two, this is going to be one of those, those, those really um, valuable things out, that products that are out there in the market. So I'll stop there and take questions. Um, I've tried to give as much time as possible to any questions that you may have um, so that we see if we can address them. And then if I can't an answer them right now, I'll take your contacts and then we we'll probably engage at a future date and, um, and, and deep dive. Feel free to type the question if you don't want to ask um, on, on, maybe you have an issue with the microphone. That was, must have been the most concise webinar I have ever given. No questions whatsoever. It's amazing.
Okay, then we can take a few polls then. If um, there's a raise your hand feature there. So let me just take a quick poll. How many people are in the process of undertaking a software build currently? Are in the process of a software build? Just raise your hand. Are involved in a project where you're building some software. Okay, so we have one. Okay, so we have two people who are taking uh, undertaking a software build. Abeneza, I'll answer your question once I'm done with my poll. Okay, so how many people are planning to undertake a software build project, even if it's at the MVP stage in the next three months? Raise your hand. Okay, so it looks like we have quite a few, okay. Okay, next poll question is how many of those who are about to undertake, and this you can feel free to answer or not, how many of those who are about to undertake um, this software build project have a budget of greater than $10,000? Kevin, your hand is still up, so I assume yours is greater than $10,000, okay? Okay, so, okay, so you've, you've put your hand down, so it's less than $10,000, okay? My final question is, how many of these projects are web-based, e-commerce-based? Just raise your hand. It's actually a two-part question, so second from last. So purely web-based, okay. And then how many of these are both have a mobile component in that there's a mobile app of sorts and also, of course, a web-based one? Okay, Kevin. Okay. Okay, fine. Um, the reason I ask those questions is because... Um, I've even, okay, Mesika has raised his hand, is I also personally put out that on my LinkedIn profile to find out how many people, what what would be a viable product to build with under $10,000. Now, the $10,000 threshold is very African because in the West, that is, I don't even know if that's considered an average size project. I think it's called a minor project of sorts. But in Africa, because of um, where Africa is, those are substantial resources that you need to put together. Um, so I got a few interesting uh, results. Um, and I think what I've done with my poll is confirm that most uh, software projects typically are under $10,000 in terms of um, uh, the, the investment that's required. And the idea there is basically to de-risk, um, which basically lends credence to the approach I was talking about, where you try and make the most value, get the most value for that investment, uh, because that also helps to de-risk the, the, the project that, that you have. So there was a question about how do you get to join Gebea? Maybe I could let you clarify, uh, are you asking to join as an individual or as an organization? Okay. 
So as an individual, Abeneza, you go to gebear.com, click on uh, like to join the network. As an individual, it will ask you to provide your details. Um, one of the things you'd be asked to do is download a mobile app, uh, depending on whether you have an Android or an iOS device. And on that app, you'll then be able to complete your profile, provide a lot more information that then would uh, get vetted. And once you're vetted and your credentials pass, you'll just join the, part, the, 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 the talent pool. Um, and I guess you know from the talent pool any assignments that a client is interested in, in, um, in, in, in working with you because there's a search capability on Gebaya where people are able to search for skills and then your profile pops up. Um, then you can then get engaged for some short-term work uh, on with that approach. Okay, so there, for the avoidance of doubt, um, you can also join as a network partner, though we've put that on hold for a while, um, where as an organization, you'd need to provide us with some details, uh, your profile, your bank, dot, not your bank details, your, your business documentation, that's tax documents, and um, your business registration. And we'd also need to do some vetting of your core team. Uh, they'll need to write some exams just to make sure that uh, they're capable of delivering on the solutions that we ask them to. And then um, if you pass all those stages, uh, you then get onboarded onto the partner network. And um, any new assignments that come through from our clients for our partners, we basically just get them uh, sent over to you. You can then choose to participate in in, in, in that particular assignment or not, it's up to you. Okay, so we are ahead of time by about 23 minutes. Any questions, comments, before I give you back time for your weekend? Okay, none. Okay, then I'd like to thank everyone. Um, oh, okay. Go ahead. I've seen you raised your hand. Okay, hello. Uh, how much time uh, would it uh, take to make uh, an, an MVP uh, of a, a medium size game project? Size? That's a difficult question to answer. Um, Typically, the idea with an MVP is to try and spend the least amount of time to produce the most important features. So um, I wouldn't give you like a specific, oh, it's only two months or one month or three months. Um, but I would, I would say that uh, if you're taking a long time, maybe past four months to build an MVP, that in itself is telling that uh, what your functionalities are for the MVP is very loaded. You may want to reduce the, the, the features that you put together on the MVP uh, so that you reduce the build time to maybe the, the rule of thumb, especially for me and the, and, and the way we work is three months. If you can do it in three months and put it out to the market, you'll get good feedback really quickly. So to answer your question, I would say between three and four months. Beyond four months, there would really need to be some heavy compelling reasons as to why you, you need to build out that, that many features. I hope that answers the question, Abeneza. Okay. Any other questions? It's a very good question, Abeneza, by the way. Something that just come up into my mind, which is that may complicate things on an MVP is language. Um, so for example, uh, if you want to do an MVP for um, uh, several different locales, uh, so it takes up multiple languages. Again, that uh, may complicate things even further because 
Um, the, the, the user experience may also need to differ depending on the background of, of those cultures where you're taking this, this uh, product to. So advisably, you may want to just focus on maybe the primary language. Sometimes it's English where everyone has a common understanding. And then uh, go to those same geographic markets with the same language and try and build in um, um, the, the localization in terms of the local language as secondary capability, maybe as an immediate business increment post MVP. Go ahead, Robel, you have a question. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my question is uh, about Gabia uh, regarding the MVP uh, process and how, what was your experience so far uh, producing MVP product and, what, and which company are mainly are working with or your past history is that in Western based or in Africa based? Just to have some idea. So what was the process so far and how are you doing it? That's my question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Robel. Um, I hope you didn't miss out the presentation, but I will share it with you. Um, so the approach you've been taking is the GMED approach I've talked about, the three steps um, that we've been, we talked about that uh, we identify, um, we basically first refine your product vision and the product roadmap. Um, we, we, um, come up with a meaningful uh, minimum viable product, then identify the engineering team to work with from our partner network. That has proven to be a successful approach with regards to, to, to delivering of MVPs or product development. I think somewhere in that's, in, that's, that's mentioned in between the lines there is we really try and, and uh, focus on what's most urgent now. Uh, so even when we're refining the product vision as a first stage, uh, we are thinking about um, just getting the biggest bang for buck, if I can talk about that with, with that particular analogy, in the MVP. And then think about anything other than that as a subsequent increment, or what we call a minimum business increment that you add on to the MVP post, post your MVP release. Um, the idea with that is to... Try and focus your resources, uh, Gebeas, the partners, yours as a, as a client, to making sure you're able to put out your best foot forward. You focus on the most important things. Um, that, that, I think, touches on the approach. Clients, um, majority of our clients have mostly been African. Um, though we've seen clients from the West who are typically Africans in diaspora, who've been able to put aside some uh, funds and would like to then invest in uh, the countries they came back from, uh, they came from, and as a result, would like to build a specific product targeted at that market. But where they're domiciled and where they work is in the West. Uh, this is the US, Canada. I've done a couple of projects with people from the US and Canada. So, but the target market for the product was Africa. Hope that answers the question. Uh, yeah, okay. thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? Maybe a question that, okay, is there an incub incubation program for startups? Um, you may need to, to quant qualify what type of startup you are. Okay, so are you building your own e-commerce platform? Okay, she left the meeting. Okay, so just to answer the question for everyone's benefit, yes, we work with a lot of startups. I don't know if we incubate them is the right term because um, we don't like provide uh, services beyond uh, what, what we typically do as GPA, though we are able to link them up with, with uh, people in our orbit, if I can use that term, 
who can help them with other elements. Um, but with regards to the creation of a software product, like in this case, an e-commerce platform, um, we would have a conversation with the startup as to what they want to do long-term as a business, and then um, what they want to see as a particular uh, initial release of that particular product and what the next immediate releases would look like. And then we would then see, uh, do you want to work with one partner or multiple partners on that particular product's development journey? If the answer is to work with one product partner is then to then identify who in our partner network we would then engage. Then we would then engage them with the understanding that this is a long-term type relationship where we're trying to help the startup get going. And um, as a result, that would even influence the, the budgets and what the spending is and even the initial uh, requirements of engineering and DevOps support for that particular startup. To the extent that um, we have a couple of people who you would call them, they have startups because this, the conversation is normally around, we are building the first product to then go look for, for, for investment from, from venture capital um, that we are engaged on just to, to, not just to build the initial product version, but also to keep the lights on with regards to support. And in case we need to tweak the functionality uh, to be able to help this particular startup position itself for funding and, and for growth. I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? Okay, um, there's a question here from Abinez. How much time does each process take approximately and which process takes the most time or focus? Uh, no, no problem, Abinez, I'm available uh, to answer your questions. Even after the webinar, if you feel there's something you, you felt you had a burning question, we can, um, I'll drop my email here. You can drop me an email and we can pick up the conversation from there. Okay, so on the three steps, the first step is where we invest the most time because that's where the, 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 the time we spend has the most return on, on, on investment. And also because it actually helps in as a getting process to the next steps. So the next steps, which is basically um, um, uh, coming up with the proposal and partner identification move much faster if we do the first step, which is refining the product roadmap and the product vision really well. Um, so we spend as much time as possible on the product vision. Um, and the aim there is to try and make sure that it is crystal clear what we want to do. So we move to the proposal stage and the partner identification and the engagement, excuse me, it's very quick. Um, and the idea is, is, is the, the, the idea with the first step is basically that, to refine the idea to a stage where we have no doubts uh, when it comes to execution. Hope that answers the question. Okay, most welcome. Okay, so we can do a final quick poll. Um, how many on the call are from Eastern Africa? Just raise your hand. Okay, I'll also raise my hand because I'm from there. Okay, how many are from Western Africa? Okay, how many from Southern Africa?
you can lower your hand if you're not from South Africa. You see, there's a guy called Eremias who looks like he's in several places at one place at one time. Eremias, you're from Southern Africa? Okay. How many from North Africa? Okay, that tells me something. Okay, fine. Any final burning questions, comments? Uh, I think we can close. Ah, okay. I'm in, I'm, I'm in CISA. I see you from East Africa. Okay. Okay, then, uh, if there are no final questions or comments, I've shared my email. You can drop me an email if you want to to have a further discussion with me or um, okay Ahmed has asked what uh, prototype mock-up tools do you use okay um, there, there are many mock-up tools and prototyping tools that um, are out there what do you have in mind is it building a software prototype or is it uh, design So are you talking about design or are you talking about like software that, okay, it's design. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, let me not talk about tools. Let me talk about um, philosophy around the tool. The idea with the tool is we encourage uh, the people who work with to use tools that would allow the, um, the quick um, creation of a software product. So case in point. If it's a tool that's so proprietary that not many people would understand, especially software developers would understand how to read and utilize it, uh, or it requires specific licensing uh, for you to read and utilize it to then come up with a software product, that's less, less uh, of a tool of interest as opposed to something that everyone commonly understands and is very reusable. So we've seen situations where people um, put things down on Miro, Mural, Miro and Mural. Let me type them there. These are two different things. As simple as Miro, Mural, as complex as Figa, Figma, and well, now they are one company. Adobe bought Figma, so they are now one company. But the idea with Figma before was. We've even seen situations where people share with us things from Canva uh, in terms of design. Um, but the idea is that it's something that if we were to share in an ecosystem of partners and, and developers, it would be easy for them to utilize and understand and, and reuse uh, the, the, the artifacts that you create. If it's difficult for them, then that's a tool that we don't, we frown upon, if I can use that term, it's, it's less, less, less um, acceptable if I can use that, that particular phrase because it encumbers the, the progression of the software creation. Now, to add on to that, we've even seen people come with certain, they've used certain software tools to prototype. What does that mean? I don't know if you've heard of low-code, no-code tools um, that allow a business user to literally come up with a functional, if you can call it that, a piece of software that does specific things uh, including even mobile apps. Um, so like in Microsoft, they have the, the, the power app suit of, of tools. So people are able to then come up with prototypes with that. The idea of that is it helps us with the first stage, which is basically refining the product vision. And then we can then use more um, sophisticated software development tools to actually build something that's more scalable and robust. Hope that answers the question, Ahmed. Most welcome. Okay, so it looks like we'll, we'll actually be on time. We have five minutes. Any further questions, comments?
Okay, then if there are none, um, okay. Is there any training package in Ethiopia? Ah, uh, Ahmed, I think you'll need to qualify the question. Uh, training for what? What in particular? Ahmed, you're seeking training in, is it software development, design, or everything? Okay, designing and deploying to mobile. Uh, mobile apps. I can inquire for you. I think um, we have certain trainings that are we've, we've, we've organized in partnership with, I think, Google. I just need to understand whether that is purely cloud-based development or it also touches on um, mobile as well. Um, so maybe what you could do is drop me an email um, on my email address, and then I see if I can follow up and, and give you some feedback on that. That's the purview of Gebea, um, but I'm sure there are other training institutions out there that basically help you train in mobile. Uh, I may also find out from within our orbit which uh, organizations can help with, with uh, training on, on mobile development. So that would be part of my response to your email. Most welcome. Any other questions? Okay, then. Um, then I'll wrap it up. Thank you very much for making time of our lunch. Most of us are from East Africa, I've seen, so it's lunchtime here. Um, thank you for making time to attend this webinar. I hope it was of value to you. Uh, we shall share with you the slides that I used for the presentation so that you can revisit them at your convenience. And uh, in case you want to engage further, um, you can then drop me an email at that email address I shared on the chat. That's richard.mag at gebear.com. And we can engage further and take the conversation to whatever you're interested in as um, be it inquiries of information or if you want to work with Gebe on your next uh, iteration or product build. Um, Abeneza, any training on DevOps, please drop me an email. I'll pick it up from there because we need to figure out if it's DevOps on AWS, um, on Azure, that kind of thing. So thank you so very much and uh, do have a great rest of the day and an awesome weekend.